Hello, and welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Quinn Spadola, Deputy Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. I'm joined by educators to talk about inspiring curiosity, creativity, and action with nanotechnology. First, I'm going to let my guests briefly introduce themselves. Marshall, why don't you go first? Sure. My name is Marshall Escamilla, and I'm one of the co-hosts of the Tumble Science Podcast for Kids. Uh, I also do all of our sound design and scoring and all of our education stuff, because prior to uh, being part of the podcast, I was a classroom teacher for 17 years total. Matthew. Hi, guys. My name is Matthew Jackson. I am a physics teacher at McEachin High School located about 30 miles outside of Atlanta, and I've been teaching for about 27 years. Thank you. And last but not least, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Plyle. I'm from the University of New Mexico now, but I did 12 years in the semiconductor industry. And then I was six years at a community college teaching micro and nanotechnology. And now I'm at the university as a lecturer, researcher, clean room manager, and director of manufacturing engineering program. And my passion is uh, bringing students into the clean room along with their faculty and teaching them how these little widgets are made that go inside your cell phones. And with that, we've got our uh, educators, middle slash podcast educator, our high school, and also at the uh, two-year, four-year level as well. And what we're here to talk about is the curiosity and creativity and action that we hope to inspire in students and using nanotechnology as one way to do that. I want to start our conversation with the curiosity part of it. What are some ways you inspire curiosity or or interest in science and technology among your students or listeners? Well, one of the biggest modalities that we use today is videos. So what I normally do is start with a a video and Marvel is like the biggest thing right now. So, of course, you know, Spider-Man or uh, Ant-Man, Black Panther, you know, or Batman or anything like that to get their attention and then just let them kind of go with it. And so they, they see a clip and then from there, I let the conversations go. And, you know, and then I, of course, guide it right back to the lesson at hand. Marshall, how do you inspire your listeners? So a lot of what we do in general, I mean, we're, we're an audio only show, right? So that's its own unique kind of phenomenon that I think engages imagination, I think more than other media, at least that's what we like to tell ourselves. Our whole thing is we talk about the process of science and how science is really just a structured way uh, for curious people to find out the answers to their questions. Um, So every episode will begin with some sort of question from a kid about something. Like uh, this week, we're working on one about answering the question, did dinosaurs burp? Just starting from that question and then telling the story of like, well, here's the question. And then how, how would we go about finding an answer? What experiments were done? What research? What evidence was gathered to kind of try to figure out what is the answer to this question? That's sort of our overall approach, and the goal is to have students understand that science is an ongoing process that's really just about answering questions and finding evidence. So, Matt, I don't know how you're going to compete with superheroes and dinosaur burps. I take another spin on trying to get them curious about science in general, but most of my students are either in the two-year community college or at the university, all the way up to, you know, Ph.D. level. And so they're starting to become really interested in jobs, right, and careers. So I'm at a good point now because of the CHIPS Act, right? And there's a lot of talk about all these new companies being built across the country, you know, um, to make semiconductor products and um, microsystems as well. So I kind of leverage that um, to let them know that there's lots of engineering and technician jobs in these spheres. Then I turn it back on them. I go, well, do you ever figure or think about how are these things made? And they're really tiny, you know? So we start those discussions and then we build on that. And, um, you know, we have specific curriculum we use for the undergraduate research experiences and then uh, all of our courses we teach. That's one way we get them engaged. And then I use a lot of images from scanning electron microscopes, very small structures, 
And one of the favorites for my students is a digital mirror device. And it's basically an array of little tiny mirrors. And you'll have like 12 million mirrors. And they can turn on and off thousands of times per second. But the key thing is, is that's the core technology used in all of our digital movie theaters now. So they've seen this thing in action, but they don't really know how it how it works. So we have a lot of fun talking about that. And then, well, how do you make the mirrors? And then we go through all of that. So that's kind of, I use the future job as the key to getting them interested and considering these, these career paths on how these things are made and, you know, what equipment's used to be to make them and things like that. How do you make millions of tiny mirrors? Oh, I can talk an hour on that, but in interest of time, I won't. But it's basically a, a layering process. So you put one material down, you pattern it, you etch it, put another material on top, pattern and etch it. And that's the same way they make computer chips. And the end result is, is you have a micro mirror on a pedestal sitting on a flexure, and it can move back and forth thousands of times per second. And it's addressed by computer chips and the light bouncing off the mirror, the color of the light is determined by either a rotating wheel with a color wheel, or um, you have three separate chips, one red, one green, one blue, um, that reflect those colors of light. And then those are merged onto the screen in the movie theater. So we, we live in science fiction times. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Your phones are just magic. That's what I tell the students. Well, I kind of do the same thing, uh, Matt, as far as uh, engagement. You know, I get them hooked as far as superheroes and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, being in high school, the big thing is what are you going to do? What's going to be your next step? And so trying to get them involved in STEM and engineering, uh, just like with you. And it's like, OK, why are you here? Why are you here in school? And of course, you get the traditional answer. I'm here because I want to learn. Uh, I get that you know traditional answer. And sometimes I get the real answer because my mama made me. And so, you know, and so I said, okay, let's go beyond that. You're here, you know, for your future. Education is nothing but information. Trying to um, go through how much engineers make, the different types of engineering, finding your passion, trying to go and to ask the question why, and trying to be creators, innovators. How would you change something? trying to do those things so they get a chance to brainstorm amongst themselves. And then, you know, of course, have, we can have a group discussion about how we can change the world for the better. Yeah. And I found if I bring them into the clean room, we do that a lot. That's where my passion is and show them how these things are made. Then it's not so scary for them. And then they start to piece together some of the things they learned in high school physics or chemistry. And, oh, gee, this is actually how it's applied. So my engineering students, you know, most, most of my engineering students are mechanical engineers because that's the department I'm associated with. So they like hands-on stuff. And um, quite frankly, we never do enough of that for them. But they love coming into the clean room. And then they actually, they've learned the theory how these things are made, but they have no tactile understanding of how it's done. And then they come into the clean room and they start to learn those, those fabrication methods, which apply to tons of different industries. I'm glad that both Matt and Matthew brought up that idea of action, that while science is, can be really cool in my mind and you can have fun questions that they want to answer, that the next step, I think, for so many is action. And I want to go back to something you said, Matthew, in particular. You talked about asking them why, but also asking them how they would change something. And to me, that ties into the creativity that is so valuable in working in science and technology or even learning how science works. Is It really takes creativity, which sometimes... I feel is lost, especially for the students who say they're only there because their mom is making them be there, but approaching it in that way. So you've got your videos, you've got your hands on. How else do you kind of capture that creativity? And maybe that's something, um, Marshall, with your having just that audio only format, how do you capture that creativity? You get the really fun question, but the answer takes so much creativity. And how do you bring that across to your students or listeners? 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's all about how you tell the story of how to go about answering a question. And, you know, one of my favorite episodes that we ever did was about a scientist who went, you know, she went to the jungles of Costa Rica because she wanted to be the Jane Goodall of sloths. And that this was her life's ambition was she just wanted to spend 24 hours in the jungle watching sloths and writing down their behavior and observing it. But then it turned out that that was impossible because sloths are too good at hiding. So she couldn't find them. <laughs> um, so then her next step solution was she had to figure out another way to collect data. And she tried collars and she tried tags, you know, all the usual things that you imagine a wildlife scientist might use. But none of those worked for sloths because their necks are too fat. They can't wear a collar. They don't have ears you can tag. There's nowhere to put the tag. And so a lot of the story was sort of her figuring out, how do I solve this problem? And the solution that she came to was that she had to make backpacks for them that they could wear while they're going about their business in the jungle. And she actually had to hand sew the backpacks for the sloths and put the little data monitors in the backpacks, put the backpacks on the sloth after she captured them. And it was from these backpacks that she discovered this kind of incredible and I think also hilarious fact about sloths, which is that they've fall out of trees on average once a week throughout their life. Um, and the reason being that they really like to eat the, you know, the new growth leaves on branches. And those, those parts of the branches are really thin and they break easily if there's a heavy animal hanging on them. And then the secondary reason is that when they get into fights, which are like the most slow motion fights you can imagine, their goal is to shove one another out of trees. <laughs> so... You know, if you can just imagine a sloth wearing a backpack that was specially sewn for them falling, you know, 75 feet out of a tree. And when they land, they bounce and they're fine. They evolved to do this. All of this was discovered because the scientist, you know, she tried one thing and it didn't work. And then she tried another thing and it didn't work. And then she was constantly having to go back to the drawing board and figure out a new solution. And this is always a feature that we include in our stories of sort of you know, you had this question and then you tried this and did it work? No, not really. So then I had to make up something else. You know, we just always are featuring scientists who have kind of crazy ways at arriving at answers to questions. So it's creativity and persistence that are really important <laughs> for both I being mean, yeah. a sloth and a scientist. I, I think so. I mean, once you fall out of that tree, you got to get right back on it as fast as possible, which is not fast if you're a sloth. Yeah, and in semiconductors, um, we were always trying to do continuous improvement, right? Make things better, faster, cheaper. And uh, I think a lot of science is that way. You make incremental, uh, very small step improvements, and then you you look back after five years, and it's like, wow, we went from here to all the way over to here, and now you know we can track sloths and trees and. I'm sure they use semiconductor <laughs> products in the backpacks to phone home and all of that fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, most definitely. They they had all kinds of sensor equipment in the backpacks, including, I think it was a pressure sensor that, you know, she was looking at the data and she kept seeing all these weird spikes in pressure. And she was like, I don't, what what is going on there? And then she actually saw a sloth fall out of tree a tree and then saw that, you know, what she'd witnessed correlated with the spike. Yeah, like, and those, oh. pressure, those pressure sensors are in your phone, too. So oh, for real? Yeah, you can tell how far up you are in altitude, and you can actually tap into those um, sensors using an app. This might be useful for uh, Matthew. Um, so you can actually measure the pressure on the top of the table and then put your phone on the floor and see the difference in pressure, and then you can calculate the height from that information. So they put those in phones for internal um, navigation inside of buildings and things like that. Thank you. I'm going to definitely uh, use that in, uh, with my students. I try to personalize science, you know. So, for instance, you know, everybody has somebody in their family with some type of disease or illness. You might have diabetes. You might have high blood pressure. Um, and so I normally tell a story about one of my former students and uh, she had a, I forgot the name of her disease, but it was very, very debilitating. And so as the year went on, she walked slower and slower and she would shake. She worked very, very hard. Uh, she studied, came to tutorial, 
And so one day I just came and I asked her, I said, you know, you work very, very hard. And she, I mean, she would stay and ask me to stay even later. I'm like, look, I got to go home. (laughs) I have a family to take care of too. You know, I would joke with her like that, but um, I would stay as long as I could. And I'm like, my God, you work very, very hard. You are like the hardest working student I've ever seen. Why do you work so hard? And so she was like, well, I have a disease and I'm not supposed to live past 18. And so she said, Mr. Jackson, I'll never have an opportunity to to drive because I shake all the time. I'll have her, never have the opportunity to go to prom, according to the doctors. And so I work so hard because I have a little sister. And I want to make sure after I beat this disease, because I'm going to beat it, after I beat this disease, I'm going to come up with a cure for what I have, not for me, but for her and for other people. And so, I I mean, you know, I'm almost in tears myself. And, you know, it takes a lot for me to cry. But I was like, oh, my God, to be, you know, um, 14 years old and to articulate that particular passion and stuff like that. And so I tell that story to my kids. And so I say, okay, there's somebody in this classroom who has a cure for cancer. There's someone, you know, in this classroom that has a cure for, you know, high blood pressure, flu. We just got through COVID. And how did we get through COVID so fast, you know, and come up with a vaccine for that? And so talking about, you know, the nano process and how all of those things were part of us being able to do something that, you know, made history by being able to do that that, that quickly. Each and every one of you guys has that within you because all of you are stars. All of you are made out of star material. And so therefore, you need to come in here, you need to do the best job that you can. And so that's how I try to personalize it. And so therefore you come up with, instead of saying they, you come up with the cure. Instead of saying, why don't they do something? No, you go, we change that 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 conversation to personalize it. And then of course you move it to the shoes on your feet, Nike and you, you know, those are engineered and, you know, everyone has, you know, some type of shoe on their feet. So, okay, instead of just wearing it, why don't you make it and become a creator? So that's another way that I'm, you know, along with you guys, how, you know, I try to get my kids inspired about science and technology and being able to use those things to change the world. Yeah, that's really good. In my classes, we do a lot of projects as well. So after they learn some of the core skills and and methods, then we let them work on a team and create different projects. So it depends on the course and what we're doing, but um, they'll they'll come up with some really wackadoodle ideas. They're actually quite neat, you know. I remember one freshman projects class. Uh, a group decided to make shoes, design shoes like stilettos, but that turned into flats. So it was primarily women on that team. And they always said, yeah, we have two pairs of shoes when we go to a party or something. And so now, you know, they only need one pair of shoes. So they came up with a way of doing that. Is that on the market yet? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. But pro- you know, probably those students are going to be graduating soon. So wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I understand it if they could do that and make a dress with pockets, I think, like, of women would be happy. (laughs) All of you talked about the student presenting the question or the challenge or the problem or giving them space to think of themselves as the people who will solve the question that they want solved or that they need solving. And And I think that's a really powerful way to recognize that there's genius everywhere and everybody has that genius. And you're, you're pulling it out by providing them with an opportunity to ask those questions, to think about those questions and maybe envision themselves making the um, sloth backpacks one day or finding the cure for their little sister. I do want to tie this, though, a little bit into nanotechnology and how nanotechnology can really help to inspire students and inspire that creativity. 
Matt, you mentioned that with with getting them into the clean room and helping them to understand how those really little tiny things work, and even you inspired that uh, curiosity in Marshall. He had to ask, how do the how do we make those mirrors? So to bring it back a little bit to uh, nanotechnology, how do you bring that into the conversation? Because you can't bring everybody right into the clean room from the start, Matt. You have to introduce them to it and. Matthew, you might not have a scanning probe, a microscope in the classroom, even though you're not too far from Georgia Tech, so that maybe you can uh, borrow their tabletop one. And, and Marshall, nanotechnology is literally invisible. So working at uh, with the audio, you're, you're kind of already ahead of the game because you don't even have to worry about how you capture something that you can't see with the naked eye. So how do you bring that into it? How do you use nanotechnology to capture that curiosity and creativity? I use it when I talk about making small things. One one of the most common structures is a cantilever, which is basically a diving board, right? When they're very, very small, you can do a lot of different things with them. One application would be, of course, um, a cantilever's use in an atomic force microscope. So it's a very small structure. It's considered micro, not nano, but it's functionalized to tap into the nano world. So I bring in nano in that way. I say nano functionalizes sensors oftentimes. Uh, It provides coatings. A lot of the semiconductor industry now is at the nano scale. They have seven nanometer transistor gates, which is amazing because when I was in the industry, we only got down to, you know, um, about 500 nanometer transistor gates. So, and that's just in the last 20 years or so, we've made a huge quantum leap. And and so we're making very, very small structures using um, microsystems fabrication methods, but that end up being nano-enabled. Um, you know, the, the, the quantum chips that they're talking about now, you know, um, leverage nanoscale structures. And so, you know, you can, you can talk about a diving board and then bring it all the way down to a micro cantilever and then talk about how it's functionalized and used by nanotechnology as well as the macro world. Well, I think everybody can imagine a diving board. So that's certainly a good place to start moving smaller into um, cantilevers and AFM tips. I have an old TV. Uh, My school, we've gone from the big, huge two televisions to, you know, the flat screen TVs and stuff like that. So I have an old TV and um, here and um, I'm, I'm going to ask permission, you know, if for for me to be able to take it apart so they can actually see the, you know, the vacuum tubes and everything else and the, the, the huge transistors and then, you know, just asking them, okay, now, now you have a TV on your arm, you know, your watch or, you know, you have your cell phone and these things. How do you think that we went from this big television here to one that's can fit in your pocket or on your arm? So going through some research and them being able to see a television. And so um, I was uh, part of the uh, research experience for uh, teachers at uh, Georgia Tech this summer. And part of that was to introduce um, uh, a lot of our teachers. And we had like five different sites all over the country, but uh, just to introduce us to Matt, what you're doing. And so we got a chance to play with a million dollars worth of equipment to see, actually see some of the processes and going through the clean room and and everything. And you, you get gowned up and, you know, it looks like you gotta get your G14 classified you know, badge to get in and everything else like that. So uh, that was cool. And I got a chance to videotape myself doing that whole process. And so um, the folks at Georgia Tech were gracious enough to extend us that opportunity and for us to be able to film and talk about uh, and do some research. And my research was um, how you make glass using indium tin oxide conductive. You know, the challenge for me is talking about nano is really not part of my a curriculum. So trying to bring that in and fit that in. So when I talk about electronics, like I said, take the TV apart, let them do that, do a little research. And then it's like, okay, now we take the glass and they, you know, so while we're going through circuitry and seeing that glass is of course non-conductive, now the whole process of applying nanoparticles to be able to, you know, any tin outside to be able to make it so it does can conduct electricity so that you can actually touch the screen and be able to do the things on your cell phone that you do. 
you know, our listeners range from age three to 13. And, you know, in my teaching career, I did teach some high school, but um, most of my time was spent with middle school age kids. And I think for those kids, you're still trying to get them to wrap their heads around general concepts of scale and proportion, you know, like how big is a light year and how small is an atom. These are, these are things that young kids don't have an easy time really understanding. I don't think grownups understand that either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, we just did a series about the size of the universe, and I, I found myself dealing with numbers where I was just like, oh, oh my God. Is there any way I can try to make uh, the distance from here to the edge of the Milky Way seem like a reasonable number that anyone can understand? <laughs> We spend a lot of time just talking about scale and proportion and size and how how that can connect to something that kids can understand. We've done a few episodes about nano-related things, and when we do that, we spend a lot of time talking about like what's what's microscopic and you know how small would this be compared to like the tip of your fingernail or something like that. I have a favorite analogy that I like to to, oh, to do. Oh, what, what's students, your favorite? But, um, I'd oh love well, to hear it. I have two. One, I have everybody look at their thumbnail, and I tell them that in one second their thumbnail grows a nanometer, but you can't see that because it's wow. so small. But every second, our thumbnails are growing a nanometer. Or another one I like is imagine you're holding a softball, and the difference in size between a softball and the entire world is similar to the difference in size between that softball and a one nanometer in diameter nanoparticle. So to the nano scale, like we can hold the world in our hands. Like that, that is the difference in size. So those are the two. I don't know how well that still hits home at that, how small that length scale is. But that one to me is like when I'm holding a softball in my hand, that's like the world to the nano scale. I, I use the hair to start with, right? A hundred hundred microns across the hair. And then I usually show some images um, of small gears made at Sandia National Labs. So the gear teeth uh, are about 10 uh, microns. And I say you take a red blood cell and put it on top of the gear tooth and it'll drape it. Right. Some kids have seen red blood cells in bio, bio class on the microscope. So they get the they get a handle on that. And and then, you know, as we progress even smaller, we talk about the angstrom. So there's 10 angstroms in a nanometer. And I say an angstrom is about the size of a hydrogen atom. And that's, you know, the, the smallest atom you, we've got. So, you know, they can kind of get an idea of that. You know, and now with the with the web telescope, you know, we're talking about huge distances and measured in light years, you know, billions of light years. And uh, and so now you've got the extreme large distances and the extreme small distances. And it's yeah, it's beyond what a lot of people can envision. How many softballs does it take to string all the way across the universe? And, <laughs> it's, yeah, when you're talking in numbers at that scale, it's like there's no there's no analogy that makes it digestible. Yeah, yeah. Powers of ten, right? There's that old uh, um, video from the what the '60s, the film Powers of Ten, and then they've remade it a few times. So you know they start out far away, and then they go all the way down to the microscopic scale, and that that helps. YouTube has a lot of videos like that as well. Um, that it it does uh, the scale of the universe, and as you just said, it will go all the way up to a galaxy, all the way down to a nanometer, and it does a very very good job. So a bunch of videos on there it does a very very good job. So it gives the kids you know a picture of it, you know. And so I'll, I'll normally use that, and then I'll tie it to. I don't know if you guys remember the old movie of uh, Fantastic Voyage, which is on the inside of you know. Someone, you know, is who could forget that? Well, no, <laughs> of the body, and I know nano is much smaller than that, but at least they can have some type of reference and imagine themselves shrinking down, you know, to be able to attack a virus or something like that. And so, you know, that kind of gets them, you know, going creatively as well. 
I mean, like, honey, I shrunk the kids is maybe my frame of reference. Honey, is, yeah. yeah. I was going to say every generation has their 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 story of exploring the really, really small, that the Fantastic Voyage, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Ant-Man, all of those. So it's definitely one of the frontiers. Yeah, th those are all really fun. Um, and it gets you thinking. So that's the key, right? Start wondering. You know, what would it be like if I shrunk down to the size of whatever and walked around? Like, I'll do that in my class when we talk about crystallography. I go, shrink yourself down, stand inside the crystal, and then start looking around. And you'll see these repeated patterns, right, of the crystal structure. So I try to get them to visualize that. I wanted to end our, our conversation today on the action part of this uh, inspiring curiosity, creativity, and action with nanotechnology. We already talked on it quite a bit and, and the idea of, of jobs, good jobs, learning, you know, approaching the world and understanding the structure of science. But I'm going to invite each of you to kind of think about what is the action you would really like to see from your students or listeners in, in a perfect world you know, Matthew, what is, what, is, what is the action you would like to see? Because not everybody needs to grow up to be a scientist or an engineer. And not everybody needs to have a PhD to be a scientist or an engineer, right? But there, there are certain things that you can hope as they get curious about science and technology. What, what do you hope they walk away with and they take with them and the actions they maybe take next from it? Number one, just the the exposure, just to have that curiosity. I mean, the cell phone is a necessary evil. It makes the kids so readily able to do something. You take something that costs, what, $2,000, and you can just open a box, and all of a sudden, they can work it. And that's not how, how you know, that's not how science is. Science is a process. And so, and it takes patience. And many times it takes years upon years for scientists and engineers and, you know, inventors to come up with one piece of, of, of whatever. And so just to learn that patience and be able to take that patience to whatever endeavor that they have in life. Uh, and so going through these uh, different experiences and hopefully they'll go to to Matt's side and be able to, OK, I want to spend maybe two years in, in, in order to get this particular degree. Well, I mean, you know, maybe I'm not, as you said, everyone's not going to college. Everyone's not going to the military or something like that. You know, I always tell my kids either go to you know college, trade school, or military, get in this just all information. One of those things. But just to 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 go and to be able to look for information, we have so many of our students. I'll just speak for, you know, in in my area that just they're just not exposed to anything beyond what they can see, and so that's very very limited. Being able to be exposed and just dream to say that you know I can do, it doesn't happen overnight. Everything's not like your cell phone. I just pull out of a box and then it just happens. Everything's not microwave, and it, it takes some real time. So. By going through um, the whole process of being able to apply, look, do some research, fail, um, I think that's one of the biggest things that people, you know, what do you learn from failure? Okay, yeah, I failed. So what are you going to do? Okay, did you learn something from it? Can you go and move to the next stage? And that's the biggest part because, you know, just going through this, this journey called life, everybody's going to fail. You know, no one's perfect. And so how do we, you know, how do we maneuver, how do we um, matriculate through life and learn from those failures and not repeat the same types of things? And so that's the biggest um, part that um, I would just like to see. I know all, all of us want to see just our kids maturing and being the best citizens that they can. I'm resonating a, a lot with what Matthew said. So it's about, you know, failing is the critical part of doing any science, right? And continuous improvement. So you learn from those failures and then you get better at whatever the failure was happened to be in. And it goes back to developing your skills as a critical thinker and also being creative in terms of solving problems. So if we can instill this to our students, you know, it's science is a way to learn how to critically think how to continuously improve oneself, you know, a holistic view um, might be beneficial to kind of point out to, to everybody because 
you know, like you you alluded to, not everyone's going to want to be a PhD, right? I mean, it's not interesting for many people, but you know, some of the basic science principles you can use to fix things in your home, figure out, you know, how to improve your energy usage for your car, you know, and and those kind of things you start applying in, into your real life solve problems on a day-to-day basis and then apply that to maybe on the community level and then national level and that sort of thing. I think for us, our orientation is maybe a little bit different, but I think very similar. I think just just like both of the mats on here, I, I, I want my kids to fail a lot and, and learn the lessons necessary from that. But, you know, neither Lindsay, who's my partner in podcasting and, and life, is nor I were really science people. I mean, my my undergraduate degree was in English, hers was in creative writing. And when we were approaching the podcast, it was not necessarily as subject matter experts as much as people who really saw the importance of science literacy to our whole, honestly, civilization. Um, and we really have as a strong goal for all of our listeners to take away just a sense of what science is fundamentally. And when the answer that the quote science gives for something changes, why did that happen? I think it's it's really important for everybody, but particularly kids, to understand where all this comes from. You know, it's a bunch of information that we come to conclusions based on evidence. And when new evidence arises, the conclusion changes. When it comes to action, our main goal is, you know, some percentage of our listeners are going to go grow up to become scientists and some percentage are going to grow up to become engineers and some are going to be science teachers and some are going to be math teachers. But I think a lot of them are going to go on and do things that are completely different. You know, maybe they'll be musicians or they'll do something that has nothing to do with science, but it's still, I think, important that they know and understand where science comes from and how it draws the conclusions that it does. That's a great way to end this. And I, again, appreciate it. You're all so curious yourselves. I could see as we were talking about this and the questions, and that was really great. And I'm thinking empower is another important thing that science and technology can do across the board, empower people to learn from failure and to understand where information comes from and to understand the process of uh, making decisions from it.